On today's Jerusalem Dateline, Christians fleeing their homes as the Azerbaijani army closes in. Is a mass exodus unfolding in front of the world's eyes? And one man's battle to present the truth about Israel, using social media to combat dangerous stereotypes. Plus, bonds of friendship between Israel and Papua New Guinea, the first Pacific Island nation to locate its embassy in Jerusalem. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to Jerusalem Dateline, I'm Chris Mitchell. In a show of Israel's warming ties to Saudi Arabia, tourism minister Haim Katz made an official visit this week to Riyadh. Tourism is a bridge to peace, he said. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu mentioned the development in a cabinet meeting. Yesterday, an Israeli minister, our friend Chaim Katz, shook hands in Saudi Arabia. There will be more visits soon. We've been flying over Saudi Arabia for several years now, and we're talking about connecting infrastructures. All this sounds unimaginable, but it didn't happen by itself. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia's ambassador met with leaders of the Palestinian Authority this week. The Saudis have said they will only normalize ties with Israel if there is major progress made towards the creation of a Palestinian state. Well, it's a major boost in the U.S.-Israel friendship. The Biden administration announcing this week that Israelis can now travel to America for business or leisure without a visa. Israel's admission into the visa waiver program has been a major priority for Israeli leaders for years. Only a select group of mostly European and Asian countries are a part of the program. While the move will save Israeli travelers from a lot of paperwork, the U.S. says it will also help the two nations fight terror together. Some critics of the program say it's a potential security risk, since Israel may only be permitted to stop around 3% of Palestinian Americans for security reasons. The U.S. also will reportedly station observers at Israeli ports of entry to ensure Israel is not discriminating against Palestinian citizens. Turning now to Armenia, where a nightmare is unfolding. Thousands of Armenians are on the run following Azerbaijan's military takeover of their homeland. Armenia's prime minister has declared that ethnic cleansing is underway. More than 120,000 Armenians live in a landlocked enclave in Azerbaijan. Many fear this takeover will wipe out their Christian and ethnic history. George Thomas has the details. Azerbaijan's Muslim majority forces seized control of the predominantly Armenian Christian territory of Nagorno-Karabakh last week. It was a nightmare. There are no words to describe. The village was heavily shelled. Almost no one is left in the village. Most people have been evacuated. The blitz attack forcing nearly 14,000 refugees to cross into Armenia, with thousands more stuck in massive traffic jams at the only checkpoint crossing. Amidst all this, a massive explosion at a fuel depot killed 20 and injured more than 300 as refugees scrambled to get gas before escaping. Joel Velkamp is with the human rights group Christian Solidarity International. Our friends there told us that people in Karabakh are deciding, some of them, to try to have the bodies of their loved ones who were killed in this war taken to Armenia in refrigerated cars to be buried there. Because if they bury them in Karabakh, they won't be able to visit them ever again, and their graves might be desecrated by Azerbaijani forces. Nagorno-Karabakh is a landlocked region between Azerbaijan and Armenia. This is an area of Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh, that has been contested for many years. It has historically been filled with Armenians, Armenian cultures, the Christian faith. While it's been internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan, the area has been ruled by ethnic Armenians for three decades. Two U.S. officials traveled to the region and met with Armenia's Prime Minister Monday. He told them ethnic cleansing is happening right now. We received word yesterday from our friends in Nagorno-Karabakh that um, essentially deportations are beginning of the entire Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh. Armenians are some of the first people in the world to embrace Christianity. Now there's concern their religious and ethnic history in Nagorno-Karabakh could be wiped out. 
the population of ethnic Armenians in nagorno karabakh should be able to remain in their homes in peace and dignity with respect for their rights and security if they choose to do so. Uh, those who want to leave and return should be allowed safe passage. CBN contributor Chuck Holton, who has reported extensively from Armenia, warns Azerbaijan's ambitions don't stop at nagorno karabakhs borders. The real concern here is that Azerbaijan is not going to stop by just taking over this one exclave. They are literally talking about taking all of Armenia. George Thomas, CBN News. They're called Confucius classrooms. 500 American schools are using a curriculum designed by China's Communist Party. Critics say the programs aim to indoctrinate students into believing that China is not a tyrannical country. Dale Hurd reports. China is believed to have spent at least $17 million establishing Confucius classrooms in 143 school districts across the U.S., teaching school children Beijing's view of the world. Confucius classrooms are the public school version of Confucius Institutes, Chinese government-financed cultural programs that operate on college campuses, like this one at George Mason University. But while Congress has cracked down on Confucius Institutes by targeting their funding, experts told the House Committee on Education and the Workforce that Confucius classrooms are operating with little or no oversight. This is a, an issue of national security. When you look at the indoctrination going on in our classrooms from several different perspectives, this is one of the most heinous. What they want to do is influence our children into believing that, no, it's a good system and China is a normal country that is not tyrannical. Confucius classrooms are presented to school districts as cultural exchange programs and the chance to learn the Mandarin language. But they're a project of the Chinese Communist government and they teach young people the Chinese Communist Party view of politics and history. So they will not talk about sensitive issues such as what happened in Tiananmen Square in 1989. They would not talk about Taiwan. And, or, or when they talk about Taiwan, they will use the official version to say Taiwan is a province of China, you know, it always and always will be. And China is offering schools big money. Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology in Fairfax County, Virginia, has reportedly disclosed that it's received at least a million dollars in donations through the Confucius Classroom Program. Nicole Neely, president of Parents Defending Education, also warns Confucius classrooms are operating near 20 military bases, influencing the children of American military personnel. To your question about the military bases, we don't know what is happening, and that to me is the most frightening part. Who are these employees? What do they have access to? And what is going back and forth, both going into the minds of our children and then what data is flowing out of these? That's a concern because Confucius classrooms also give the Chinese government access to data about the schools and the students. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Coming up, a prominent social media influencer speaks up for honest coverage of Israel. Hananya Neftali serves as media advisor to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and he makes it his personal campaign to correct misperceptions about Israel. He spoke with us about his motivations. Hananya Neftali, great to be with you. We're here at Ramat Raquel, and uh, you just spoke on the importance of the media battle uh, for Israel. Tell us how important it is that uh, this front lines of this battle for truth is to the Jewish state. I think that it's essential because today truth is such a rare ingredient in our world. You see so much lies, deception. They, you know, nowadays anti-Semitism comes in the new form of anti-Zionism. They say, we don't hate Jews, we only hate Israel. That's a lie. What I'm doing on social media is to tell the truth, to combat the lies with the truth, to tell facts that are so much needed to be heard. Uh, that's actually how I started. Give us an example of, uh, you know, the kind of truth you present as opposed to what you see in the social media or ma the mainstream media. So, for example, I, I think that recently we all saw that people were talking about apartheid in Israel, that people say that Let's be honest, there is apartheid in this country. And the thing is that when you just take a walk, take a stroll on the Jaffa Street, you will see Muslims, Christians, Jews walking side by side together. Israeli Arabs, they enjoy freedom, equality. Uh, you know, Israel is not perfect. 
but show me one country that is perfect. You know, talking about the Palestinian people, uh, they can come to Israeli cities, nothing will happen to them. They can enjoy the beach in Tel Aviv, but if I go to Ramallah, if I go to a Palestinian city, I'm not sure I'll be back alive. Um, so when people say that there is apartheid, I say, you are right. There is apartheid, but it is against us Israelis. Only because I have an Israeli passport, an Israeli ID, that uh, prohibits me from going to Palestinian cities. Uh, while they, with the right permit, they can enjoy time in Israel. Yeah. Tell us what the platforms you use and, and what kind of response do you get from uh, people that all over the world that, uh, that really watch you and follow you? So I, I have to say social media was uh, not natural for me. But I, when I served in the Israel Defense Forces, I saw that there is a need. I saw that they were calling us war criminals. I saw that they were telling me we're killing Palestinian people. And that was complete lies. I was not okay with that. Um, so I said that I'm going to change that. I'm going to take action. I will do something about it. So I started to make videos about Israel. I said, okay, what can I do? Videos. Just like I fought Hamas terrorists in Gaza, today I fight anti-Israelism terrorism on social media. Um, so I, I think that an amazing example that I, I have is that I got one message from this guy in Lebanon that tells me he opens the window and he sees flags of Hezbollah. But he says, my heart is with you, with the Israeli people. I know the truth because I consume it on social media. This Times Square uh, of, of the world where everybody comes to consume mm -hmm. and to, to be heard and to say stuff. So I think that this is a great example that shows that there is power to social media and you, it has no borders. That's the beauty of it. So how can people follow you and what would you encourage people to do is if they want to uh, advocate for, for Israel and the Jewish state? Well, first of all, you are able to find me on social media. I believe in being everywhere. Uh, so be it YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Hanania Naftali, that's where you could find me. Mm -hmm. And I think that for those that want to take action, for those that say, okay, I've been silent for too long, now it's time to get on the proactive um, you know, stage in life. I think that first of all, praying is an active thing, but on top of that, also participating in conversations. When people tell lies, don't be silent. When people bash Israel, it's not just our battle. It is a battle on your values. It is a battle on your family as well. Because those that attack Israel, at the end of the day, they will not stop there. Hmm. So final question, Neftali. Uh, what would you say, how important is this battle? I mean, is this as, as important as coming against Iran's nuclear program, or coming against Hamas or Hezbollah? How would you equate this battle in the social media world? So. When I began my action on social media, I never imagined that you know it would reach millions of people. I just said, okay, I have this passion, let's do something with it. But very quickly, I realized that one tweet has an impact of an entire army. One video can change the minds of millions of people. And when you just realize that, you can make so many friends for Israel, so many people that would hear the truth. I don't ask people to love my country. I just want them to have the truth and decide for themselves. Right. Well, Hanani and Naftali, great to be with you, and uh, hopefully many people will be following you on uh, social media. Thank you very much. Up next, talking with a special friend of Israel whose country went the extra mile to show its support. The Pacific Island nation of Papua New Guinea made headlines recently when it placed its embassy in Jerusalem. Reverend Joseph Walters was at the opening ceremony at the invitation of Papua New Guinea's Prime Minister. Pastor Joseph Walters, great to be with you on CBN News Jerusalem Dateline, and we're happy that you watch uh, Jerusalem Dateline at Papua New Guinea. We do, many miles away, Chris. Uh, that's great. Yeah. You're here because the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea invited you to the ceremony to mark the move of the Papua New Guinea Embassy to Jerusalem. What was that ceremony like? It was awesome, historic for our country, and I was invited as a church leader to represent the faith of the Christians in Papua New Guinea, which is based on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Bible that we teach and we preach from. Why is it so significant for Papua New Guinea to move their embassy here to this Well, city? a lot of things have taken place in our country, including bringing a 400-year-old original King James Bible, a lot of prayer, a lot of Christians subscribe to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there is now a possibility of changing the country into a Christian country 
by the national parliament uh, and a number of other things that uh, uh, naturally made the government see that it's only correct for us to put an embassy in Jerusalem. And at the opening of the embassy, our prime minister said that it is not complete, our Christian faith in your court, when he talked to Mr. Netanyahu, is not complete without our embassy in your city. Now, what impact do you believe it's going to have on your country? Big impact, Chris, already. The people are excited, and especially the Christian populace is so excited that our government has made that move and stand. And uh, we believe that uh, with our connections to Israel, the continued uh, friendship we have, and the building of the embassy will bring blessings to us, you know, as promised by God in Genesis 12, uh, 2, 3 to Father Abraham. Now, you've been here and meeting with some government uh, officials, including Prime Minister Netanyahu. What, what, um, how have they reacted to this move? They're very excited. Mr. Netanyahu is so excited that Papua New Guinea has been the first Asia-Pacific nation to establish embassy in Jerusalem. And Mr. Netanyahu said, when our Prime Minister invited him to reciprocate his visit, he said, whenever you invite me, I would like to come to your country. And then we talked to business leaders to invest in Papua New Guinea. Ah, I mean, do you see this as uh, an economic benefit to, uh, to Papua New Guinea as well, as well as to Israel? Big time for Papua New Guinea, economic, technology, health, power supplies, and whatever Israel can offer in the agriculture sector. We're all excited and looking forward to that. What would you say to other nations or other leaders that are considering moving their embassy here to Jerusalem? Well, I mean, if they are Christian leaders and they, they have Christian uh, standing and faith, it's the right thing to do, Chris. It's the correct thing to do to recognize that Jerusalem is God-appointed eternal capital of the nation of Israel. And so it would be right for them to move through or establish uh, if they haven't done yet in the city of Jerusalem. Well, Pastor Walters, thanks for joining us on uh, Jerusalem Dateline. And uh, it's so exciting that uh, the embassy of your country is here in Jerusalem. Thanks for having me. God bless. When we come back, one man's resilience of mind and spirit and the CBN friends who came along beside him. Hello, I'm Pastor Joseph Walters from Papua New Guinea. It's a nation in the Pacific, just north of Australia, and you are watching Jerusalem Dateline. You've heard the saying, you can't keep a good man down. CBN Israel heard about an individual who had immigrated from Ukraine and needed some help. And thanks to support from CBN partners, they were able to help give him a hand. Hear his remarkable story of resilience. As a young man growing up in Ukraine, Boris was an aspiring athlete, but a debilitating sporting accident caused Boris to lose the use of his legs over time. When I came to Israel, the doctors told me I needed surgery, but there was little chance that I would get better. The surgery didn't go well. It was a very difficult time. I was really depressed. I couldn't grasp it. I suddenly realized that the past was gone and I had no future. I had nothing I could hope for. With time, Boris learned to get around in the wheelchair, but on the inside, he was filled with anger and hopelessness. Over the years, Boris started having difficulty rolling his wheelchair for long distances. He preferred to stay at home, but that made him feel lonely. My shoulders were hurting from the constant strain. I couldn't go very far, and I couldn't talk to people. Your donations to CBN Israel provided help for Boris to get a special motorized chair, and now he is free to move around and help others. It was a blessing from God that he sent through you. We are one family spread out in the world. I'm so thankful for the donors that provided this help. You can't put a price on selfless help. I just see God working through your support. All I can say is, Thank you. With Yom Kippur behind us, we're on the eve of the Jewish holiday known as Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Take a look at this dramatic presentation of the biblical command to observe this festive holiday. ויצמח פורקני ויקרב משיחי. בחייכון ובמיכון וכל בית ישראל, 
You shall dwell in booths for seven days, so that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in the desert when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. You shall rejoice in the presence of the Lord your God seven days. God displayed his presence to the people of Israel in the wilderness. Even so, they chose to turn astray and followed in the ways of other nations. God dispersed them throughout the peoples before bringing them back to his land. God commands his people to dwell in booths in exhortation that he is in control. In obedience, we build temporary shelters as a reminder that dwelling with him in the wilderness teaches us to rely on him for all of our needs. The Feast of Tabernacles is the culmination of God's plan of gathering the nations to Himself. It's a promise to bring together the faithful of many nations to join the commonwealth of His people. I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. And to all our Jewish friends, Hag Sukkot Sameach. Happy Feast of Tabernacles. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.